Let's have a good night, one and all. We give God praise. We give him thanks, honor, and glory for the wonderful opportunity and privilege that he has afforded us today. And so many of us, as we look at life, we can move around. We are still mobile. And one of the things that I always say, we are present. Many of our friends and close ones are absent from the body at this moment. But yet still we understand the facts of the word and the power of the word. Being absent from the body means that you are present with the Lord. But again, let us be realistic. It's based on the life we live. It's based on how we prepare ourselves to meet the Lord. So this is what is important here. As we look closely into the word and what the word is really saying to us and where and how it is guiding us, how it is guiding our steps so that we can give unto God as we ought to. Because this is all he asks of us, to worship, worship him. And we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So as we are about to go into this lesson tonight, beginning, we are still in the seventh chapter of Romans. And I'm going to step back to the seventh verse, and we are going to start from there. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what I would like you to do is get your Bibles while I'm speaking. Find the room, find Romans 7. And we are going to identify the verse. We are going to go from there, from the seventh verse. And there are some questions that we need to ask ourselves as children of the Most High. And those of us who are called, predestinated, set forth to do the will of the Father. It is important that we begin to question our lives. Sometimes in questioning your life, you have to make certain choices that the flesh do not really want. The flesh continues to cry out. And we are going to see this as we go into the lesson tonight. I'm thanking God for the opportunity to come before you one more time. And I'm asking God to guide our steps. Heavenly Father, direct us as we go along this journey as we seek to study your word, as we seek to get into your word, as, and asking you to define the word for us so that we will be able to better understand rather than coming here, O oh Lord, and our, our ability, our skills. Father God of Israel, the Holy Ghost is the one who gives skills. So I am inviting the Holy Ghost to work with me and through me and in me in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, the Christ. You who, are, you who was anointed, you who was sent forth, you are the true vine, help us to hold and never give up, but trusting in you and all that is mine to pray for at this moment. Father God of Israel, I bring those that are sick. No need for me praying for those who are absent from the body because I know they have to make their path right with you. But I pray for those who are left behind with the burden to continue and to go on. Have mercy, Jesus, and hear and answer our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, O thou great El Shaddai, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So tonight as we look into the lesson from verse 7. Of the seventh chapter of Romans, verse 7. It's really speaking to us. And if we look at where we are today in the world and the things that is surrounding us, you're going to realize that it was no different now than it was then. Humans are humans, there and now, then and now. And we will always be human. The only difference we may have a little more knowledge in the sense of the word. But they were filled with the spirit. So there is a balance. There is nothing, listen, there is nothing that we can boast on. Because when we have the word and all we do is just sit back here and say, well, the Bible says this. They were dependent on the spirit to guide them, to teach them. And to help them to understand 
what God was saying to them through the word. And God in his mystery, I, I say mysterious way, raised up men such as Paul to truly share with us and to bring those who fell short, you know, as, as Paul glorified God for the Romans. And you hear me speak of the Romans. I'm talking about those who, who came together and witnessed the blood and water that flowed from his side, witnesses cried, they were converted and they lived believing that Jesus Christ was the Son of God or is the Son of God. And they glorified him, they gave their lives, supported Paul in his ministry and blessed the Lord because they acknowledged and hear the cry of one of them. And not just one, but we speak of the one that pierced him at his side. He said, truly, this is or was the Son of God whom we have killed. He that confessed with his mouth and believe in his heart that Jesus is the Son of God shall be saved. So when we look carefully at all of these areas here and we try to apply them, we are going to have peace. Paul continues in this lesson here. He said, what shall we say then? And you would observe that there is a question mark there. Let us look at where we are today and the prophecies of Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and all the other prophets when they began to speak and they say, the time is going to come when we are going to take the wrong and say it's right and we are going to take the right and say it's wrong. Evaluate for yourself. Look around us and see what is happening. Look around us and see how life has changed. Where the wrong becomes right and the right becomes wrong. We no longer walk on the biblical principles that's supposed to guide our steps. We are doing things to suit the flesh rather than to give unto God the honor and the glory. He said, is the law sin? And as we go down into this lesson, you're going to realize that the law is not sin. You have to understand what the purpose of the law was. When sin entered, the purpose, the law is holy because God is not going to give us anything that is unholy. He is going to bless us with that which is good for us. But the problem there is because sin was so powerful and still is today, man could not and the desires of the flesh that natural inborn ability to sin we were born with that you don't teach a baby to lie and those of us who have raised children we never taught them to lie but because of that in and i want you to really take this serious this is not a joke because of that inborn nature, that nature, that natural nature to sin. Did you move that? No. It's a lie right there. You never taught him to lie. So what you have to do now is to try to train him differently. I don't want you lying to me. And this is what God is asking of us today. So that we can give unto him our heart. All he asks is give. You know, you're not going to see this written in the book, but consider it. He said, if you give me your heart, I'll give you a kingdom. But this is what he came doing. He came giving us his heart. He came giving us his life. In order so that we would see the good work that he had done. And as he said, if you are going to judge me, judge me by the works. Judge me by the things that you have seen me do that no man alive have ever done. There was no man to raise the dead except our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So when we look carefully, we're going to understand what is happening. Yes, we can go back and say, well, Elijah did this and Elijah did that. Yes, and Peter. But there were circumstances that necessarily needed intervention. Was it really Elijah? When he laid on that widow's son and he prayed, was it Elijah the man 
No, church, it was not. But there was no man to really do what Christ did. To stand at the graveside of a man that was dead for four days. And cry with a loud voice. Lazarus come forth. So when we go back into all of these areas here. And history has proven that this is true. You see you couldn't do all of these things. And the Romans will not take note of it. Because they were good historians. And they were keeping a complete check on Jesus. For this reason, again, I say to you, the Jews were afraid of what Jesus was doing because they believed that the authority would have been taken away. So as we go into all of this, we see here, is the, sin law, is, is the law sin? No. And we would realize as we move on into the lesson, the law was not sin, but the law pointed out sin. The law brought us to the acknowledgement where, where and when we sinned. This is what the law did. So Paul answered with a, in the affirmative, God forbid. And this is, the first, this is the seventh verse. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? And with bold authority, and this is what is required of us today. You know, sometimes you would ask a question, we are dealing with the word and the question, a question will ask. You will hear some people speaking, but you can't hear what they're saying. They're saying the right thing, but they're fearful of God. They're fearful. And this is what Paul is showing us here. And you would observe in capital letters, God forbid. Nay, don't even think like that. Don't even enter, I, I, I'm just reading the scriptures, N-A-Y, this is what it says, God forbid, nay, what he's saying to you, I want you to go back into days and really get it, what he's saying here, don't even think like that, how could you think that the law is sin, you must be able, and this is how he's, he's ministering unto them, you cannot think like that, no, the law is not sin, but as he continues in this, he said, I had not known sin, but by the law. What the law did was point out our sins with the intention that we would turn from it. But again, I say that inborn nature to sin, to lie, you know, that is only the grace of God can really remove this from us. And Paul is recognizing this. Because Paul is one who believed, and I believed in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you know. Paul is one who would take his garment, take the garment of those who would stone you to death and hold it on his arms with a decree in his hand. And he would watch them stone you to death. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And according to the law of Moses, this is who he was. But because of grace, because of the love of the Father towards you and I, and this is why we have to look at these scriptures and look at them carefully, he said, I had no sin, meaning before the law, everything to me was right, and whatever I did, remember what the scriptures say, those who know the law will be judged by the law. And those who were without law cannot be judged by the law because they had no law. Everything was all right. But man was going to the extent where he didn't care. We were true barbarians in the fullest sense of the word. So as we look carefully here and try to understand what Paul is saying, he said, but by the law, but by the law, I had no sin, not, I had not known sin. I'm just correcting myself here. I had not known sin, but by the law. Listen, what did the law do? And we're going to see what is happening here. For I had not known lust. In other words, I, I could see any woman or oh, whatever, as it was then, so many things that was. Consider Sodom and Gomorrah and all the things that they were doing. 
until the law came. And then it became sin. It was raw. Because God saw that we were abusing the privileges and freedom that we had to live. And to enjoy the things that surrounded us upon the face of the earth. This is what Paul is saying. I'm just reading the word to you. I had not known, listen, but by the law. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known loss, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Except when the law said, Thou shalt not covet. And the covet here doesn't only mean in the sexual way or your neighbor's wife or as the case may be. The greed that is moving within our hearts and in the life of humanity today. The more you have is the more you want. And you don't care what it takes to get what you want. You wouldn't allow your, 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 your sons and daughters to sell drugs, but you would give it to my sons. You would give it to my daughters. Anywhere that you can make that filthy lucre that will come in. But God is speaking here. And Paul is trying, and I'm trying to bring everyday life into the world because, you know, sometimes we get so over righteous that we cannot see what is happening in our lives today. And we need to understand that our life today is no different to what it was then. Men were going their own way. Men were doing things as it pleased them. But today we have to take a good look at ourselves. As it says here, I want to read this ver part of this verse again. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. That is the commandment, the law. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Nothing that belongs to thy neighbor. You should try taking it away. You know, a long time in the, you know, in the islands, I can speak of the islands, you know. People, you, sometimes your neighbors, you, you, you have your, your, your bong repose. But your neighbor will, will move that bong repose. You know, his, he moves his and put it way into your, your property. And he's taking a little six inches by a little six inches. And if you don't notice, he way into your property. Now, this is what is going to happen here. When you recognize and you see what is going on, what do you think is going to happen? We begin to fight against each other. So two neighbors now live in an enmity. And this is the reason for not coveting. What is yours? Accept it. What is mine? Help me to protect it so that I would help you to protect what belongs to you. And this, is the, this was the purpose of the law. That we live in unity one with the other. That we bring joy and peace to families. That, you know, when I cook, I could give to you. Today, if somebody offer you a plate of food, you had to think twice before you eat it because you don't know what's going on. And we must be honest with ourselves because the hands of men and the heart, this is why the scripture was so powerful in itself. He said, don't dip your hands into iniquity. You come in smiling, handing me a plate of food, but you know, after I eat that plate of food, I go and stare in mad for some stupid thing. How can I trust you? And this is what the scripture is saying here. Thou shalt not covet. And why are you doing this to me? Because maybe you see, I have something that you want. So in order to get what I have, you have to get rid of me. And we have to be careful. We have to face these things as it is. The word is speaking to us. Paul says here, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not. You know, sometimes we believe that it's okay. It's okay. And we need to understand what it means 
to really turn away from the weaknesses of the flesh. And I don't, you know, sometimes I wonder, because we, be, we, so be, we, so, we are so immune then to sin that we believe everything that we are doing is right and we are prayerful people. But sin is sin. Your sin is no different to my sin and we have to be very careful with that. So we have to seek to overcome all that will come against us and cause us to step away. You know, sometimes I'm bringing the word and it's speaking to me. Not sometimes, but all times. So I don't want you to sit on the other side of me and think that I'm coming at you. No. This word is speaking to my life, speaking into my life. Just as Paul is saying here, at one point in time, Paul said, the things that I would, I would not, and the things that I would not, that I would, because sin is so deep in my flesh. And this is why we have the struggle, as you have heard last week, the struggle between the two natures. That was the topic last week. And we have to understand this and recognize that there is truly a struggle. And worst of all, when we're lying to ourselves and we still come into God and we say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. We are going to have sinful desires. But I'm saying, let us seek to overcome and to live right and to do what is right and to give unto God the honor and to give unto Him that glory that he sent forth within the law that none of us could have fulfilled. Because if we could have, I mean, just tried to uphold the law, what a beautiful place it might have been. But we could not. So in order to make sure and secure our future, he sent his son, who came and died, to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. But as we continue in the 8th verse here, you know, I'm trying to show you how powerful these verses are. And let us not just read it, you know, because we are avid readers. But let us seek to understand, to break it down, so that we can truly know what God is saying to us. This 8th verse says, But sin taketh occasion by the commandment. But sin taketh occasion by the commandment. The sin, when it begin to, I mean, show itself to me, when it begin to make known unto me that I'm swimming in waters that is infested with shark. You know, all the time you're swimming, but the moment you see a fin, you're going to read, wow, it doesn't have to be a shark. But you see a fin moving in the water, and something comes over you, which is fear. And this is what should happen today when we are finding ourselves in areas that is not according to the will of the Father. Sometimes guilt overshadows me so much that, I, you know, you, you want to stay away from everyone and everybody. This is how it helps. You know, some of us doing it, doing it wrong, and we feel we are so right. You know it's wrong, but you're going to still tell God it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's wrong, and it's still wrong. And this is what this lesson is saying unto us. But sin take it occasion by commandment. Sin making its claim in our lives rather than the commandment or the law should have its way in our lives. We, we are not giving heed to the law, but rather we are giving heed to lust. And this is a terrible place to be. By the, listen, occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiences. And I know this is a term, this is a word here, many of we don't go back and look at it. The con concupiences here really mean covetousness. So this is what I'm showing you here. It's not all about sex. 
It's about greed, covetousness, the word concupiency, meaning covetousness in its fullest form. You see me with a white dress? You want a white dress too, and you're going to try to buy one that is better than mine. I bought a Camry, and you're going to buy a BMW because you, this is what's happening. We go in competition, covetousness. You want to show me how powerful you are. This is not what it should be. This is not, as a matter of fact, where we should be. But we should be one, assisting each other along the way. And this is what this is saying here. And I, I, I use the word concupiences because this is, it's in the eighth verse here. And it's showing you it means covetousness. I try to break down these words so that we all will understand. Because, you know, the first time I begin to read this and I begin to meditate upon it, I'm wondering, well, what does concupiences mean? But it simply means covetousness. They're all English law. You know, but you have to break the word down. And when you break the word down, you're going to understand what it is. So we are to being told here to come out of this covetous attitude. I come to church and, and you know, you see me with a nice hat. You went, you're going to buy a hat better than mine. And as the scriptures say, let us not move in that manner. I, I have to bring back to you. 2 Corinthians 5 and 12. And I wish you would make that one of your, your nuggets in the Bible. You know, because we continue to walk in appearance and nothing hard. And we have to be very careful as we go along this journey. So my joy here is to share the word with you in its entirety. Not just running down the word, not coming here to you with stories. I'm not here to tell you stories. I'm here to tell you, thus said the Lord. So we are told here, right, what happened, the law, by its commandment or occasion, become, listen, I want to read that eight verse again. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, when the commandment begin to speak to us, thou shall not this, and thou shall not that, and thou shall not the other. You know, as the ten of them stands out in our lives. So when the commandment begin to speak, it began to point out where we are, the hate, the anger, the greed, the politics that we practice both in the church and out of the church. And if I need to get here, I know what I'll do. And if I need, and we have to be very careful as we go along these journeys. So my call, according to the scriptures tonight, if the commandment is working in your mind and in your heart and pointing out to you how covetous you are, don't blame the preacher. Don't blame anyone else. But this is who you are. And what can we do about this? The very book of Romans tells us, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Seek a new mindset. Seek a new way. Why all the hate? Why all the anger? And we're not sitting back and thinking, well, maybe Tom didn't call me today. I'm expecting a call from Tom and he didn't call me. You didn't even try to find out if something went wrong. You're angry. I hope you don't die with anger. But you free yourself. And that you walk in the way of the Lord. This is important for us. And this is what the lesson is sharing with us here. For without the law, sin was dead. Paul is really breaking down this message to us. Before the law, the commandments was, sin was dead. But sin was brought to life when God saw the weaknesses and the errors of man and he handed down to Moses some conditions for us to live by if we are going to be his children. Remember when Moses went to receive this. He couldn't even look on the face. He could he see the hinder part of Jesus. And when he came down to the people, what it, 
he had to hide his face. God said, you cannot see my face. And all he saw was the hand apart, the back part of Jesus. And that was so bright. Remember what the book of Revelation says. When that time should come, we don't need no street lights. Because God and his son will be the light in that new Jerusalem. Could you imagine that? How big this place is going to be. And the Father and the Son is the light wherever you move. And then you, I, want to, I want to compliment you. You are going to be transformed also into that glory of life. Because the whole idea here is to share with us that we can share with him in that place where he had gone, that we. And John tell it to us. I don't know what we're going to be looking like as John speaks. He said, but we are going to be like Christ. Illuminated. That Shekinah glory. That is going to be overshadowing us. And this is why we have to understand these words that is being spoken to us by the, by the, in the Bible. But sin take it occasion by the commandments. The commandment point out sin. The commandment show us where we went wrong. Wrath in me all manner of concupiences. Because what we would do, we would just step into our, our neighbor's boundary. And our neighbor will step back and who is stronger is going to, and then we're going to pull a cutlass and we're going to do whatever we have to do. And a man die, you know, people just get, you kill him. But there was no law. Imagine we have all these laws and there is so much killing still. The fear of the Lord is not with man. When he feels you shouldn't be there, he is going to seek to get rid of you. But this is why I'm asking you to trust in the Lord. And understand what he is saying. And because he recognized we could not uphold and upkeep the law, he sent his son. Look at what it's saying here in the, in the ninth verse. For I was alive. You know, sometimes I know because personally... Sometimes I go through, I went through these scriptures and you would ask yourself, what is this saying here? But I remember the, the Enoch, the eunuch. And I always say to you, he was not a dumb man. But yet still he asked, you, you could go back to Nicodemus. Was not a dumb man. Member of the Sanhedrin Council. But sometimes a stupid question to us is a wise question. How can I enter into my mother's womb, a big old man like me, <laughs> and be born again? What are you saying? Isn't this silly? Yes, it is. But you see, the mystery of the words that were spoken, the mystery of that new birth, he could not understand until it was explained to him. And this is what was happening with the eunuch. When Philip asked him, understand this, what thou readest, and this is another thing. We must be willing to open up so that people can feed us. If you keep your mouth closed, you will never be fed. But he was not ashamed, even in the authority in which he sat. As treasurer to the queen of Candy. He was open unto Philip and said, how can I understand what I'm reading except there is someone to teach me? And this is what we have to start doing. Be honest with ourselves and open our hearts so that we can receive from God. He said, listen man, this is beautiful scripture. For I was alive without the law once. I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Sin was always there. The wrongdoing was always there. But when the commandment came, I got to know what sin really is. I got to understand what sin really is. I got to understand the holiness of the creator of this world. I got to understand the light in which he shines. 
And this is Paul speaking. Because I could imagine the bright light that he saw on that Damascus journey where he was going on there to persecute those who were going according to this way. And when he behold the light, you heard his cry, Lord, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And this is what is happening here. This is what he is saying here. When the commandment came, sin revived. So when I saw that light, when I recognized that this is a force that was so bigger than I, this is something with all the decree that I had in my hand, I could not. So I fell to the ground because this mysterious power, this mysterious force overshadowed me. The light was so bright that I went blind. I want you to understand what you're saying here. Sin revived and I died. Because I became guilty. The sentence of death was, was so heavy upon me, even though I didn't know it. It was so heavy upon me. So I understand what sin really was. And we have to bring ourselves to that point. You see? And let us go on. He said, I died. Remember what Romans 6 tells us. We have a death to die. And the death is to the flesh. So that we can be awakened in the way of the spirit. So that we can be enlightened in the way of the Spirit. So that the Holy Spirit can truly speak with us, through us, and in us. Righteousness in and righteousness out. We must be able to reach to that point whereby we can truly give unto God the way we ought to. He says, sin revive and I died. Where are we today? Where are we today? What are we doing? You know, sometimes I, I sit back and I think, you know, a, a good friend of mine just died a few days ago, a week or so. But I looked at him and there was so much in him that I, I used to be questioning. But God is so merciful. He could have died in a home, in his home, and, and nobody would not have known. But the God of mercy and his daughter. And she took him. Nobody expected him to pass this way. But he didn't last a month. But the good thing about him, when I spoke to the daughter, she said, Dad is, a, Dad is comfortable. He has his own room, he has everything. Whatever you need, we have somebody to take care of him. What a privilege. And those of you who want to stand back and judge somebody, but he had a good heart. He may have done things that I don't like, but who am I to judge him? Who am I to say yes or no? He has to answer to God. And this is what is happening to us. And this is what Paul is reminding us of here. Are you willing to acknowledge that sin has revived? Are you willing to acknowledge what has taken place in our presence? Are you willing to acknowledge how mankind has become so greedy that he don't care what he do? He, he know what is wrong. He, but yet still, he will do anything to get or to achieve. We need to come down. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to you as, as I would like or would have liked my elders to speak to me. Few of them did. And I want you to know that this is not all about you and this is not all about me. 
But this is about what God will have us to do. And this is what Paul is saying here. That Damascus journey had transformed my life and made me the person that God wants me to be. But yet still, even though I'm doing all of this, there is still sin in me. Because the things that I would, I would not. And the things that I would not, that I would. And this is what is happening to us. This is what is happening to us today. So we have to seek to overcome that. The 10th verse. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found it to be unto death. You hear what I said earlier? The commandment was ordained to give life so that we could come and have that fellowship, that oneness. You remember that fellowship that Adam had with God? Look at, the, look, at, look at how far we have moved from that. Where God used to come down and speak with Adam at the cool of the day. And I imagine the relationship that they had. A father to a son. And you would ask him how the day went. What you did today, son. You know, I, I, my, my grandson started a new school today and I looked, the, the mom sent a picture for me and to show me well he started school. And when I looked at him, the way he stood up in school, you know, his, his head down, because he don't know anybody there. A new school, and, and you would feel a way for him. He has to adjust and readjust. So you know what I did? Before I started this program, I called him to find out how the first day went. What's going on with you? And he's, not, he's now eight years, so you know he's, he's going to feel. But good thing, children will make friends, and they will make friends faster than you and I. Because you will see me here for days, you will pass me up and down, you would not even say hello. But with children, they will make friends. And this is what Jesus wants from us. He that humbleth himself as a little child, will the heaven and the Holy Spirit exalt. And this is why we have to bring ourselves humble before God. This is what Paul is doing here. You're talking about a powerful man who was transformed by the light of the Holy Spirit. That when he asked the question, Lord, Lord, what will thou have me to do? He heard, if he is the last, was the last apostle of God, be the, to God be the glory. Because Jesus said unto him, Christ, I am Christ. Why kickest thou against us? So when we begin to understand what is happening here, you in your revelations, you who receive from God, and there are those of us who are not receiving, as I said last week, some of us have moved so far away from, from God that we are not even getting revelations, we are not even getting visions anymore. And if you get a vision, it's just an, oh, that's just another dream, as I've heard so many in authority speak. God speaks to us through dreams and visions. And I do accept the fact that there are dreams and there are visions. You have to know the difference between. But everything is telling a story and it's up to you to ask God, what meanest thou? Be like Paul. What will thou have me to do? How am I supposed to handle this situation? Not just stand up, Lord, look at that bright light. Woo! No, that's not what it is. That's not what it is. But you saw how he operated? What will thou have me to do? And because he asked the questions, he received answers. Answers. Remember Matthew 7, 7? Seek and ye shall find. You know, and I always say it, the three keys of the scriptures that was given to us by God. Through his son Jesus Christ. Seek and he shall find. We will be in a class. And we will be in an office. We will be in some area where something is taking place. And you know sometimes we sit there with our mouth closed. We are in a meeting. And when you come out of the meeting. You say but I should have asked this. And you, somebody who is asking questions. You get angry with them. Because they are asking too much questions. But you are not asking any questions. How can you grow? So we have to think again. 
and realize that Christ came really giving us what we needed. Even those three keys that he had given unto us. When he said, seek and he shall find. Think the depth. Think about the depth of it. Consider when he said, if you ask for a bread, I would not give you a stone. If you have asked for a fish, I will not give you a serpent. If you ask for an egg, I will not give you a scorpion. And remember, a father, as an earthly father, knoweth to give good gifts unto his children. Consider your heavenly father. How much better gifts he is able to give unto you. So tonight as we sit here and as we begin to meditate, I choose to sit. Because sometimes we get all so excited. But I want you to understand what is happening here. And work with what God is sharing with us. And the commandment, the 10th verse, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Because it began to point out my sins, the sins of the world, the destruction that is before us, with all that is being said, and it's only being said from the mouth, not from the heart. We have to question all of these things. We have to walk in all of these things and break it down. You know, sometimes I ask God, I say, why are you sending me through these scriptures? Why are you directing me in these areas here? I've never seen or heard these scriptures broken down the way in which we pick a verse here and we pick a verse there. And we speak, well, this said that and that said that. Yes, and I do move from here to there, but I do it to show you in support of the very verse. But I'm not just speaking a verse because I want to tell you something. I'm speaking as the word of God speaks to you and to me. The 11th verse. Let's take a look at it. For sin taketh occasion by commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Can we read that again? For sin take an occasion by the commandment. By the commandment. The occasion of sin or the purpose, we, when we get to understand sin, when we recognize where we are, what is this occasion about? Why are we gathered here? This is what occasion is. Why are we gathered here? Why are we gathering within the house of God? The occasion here is to worship. But when this occasion, the act of sin and the, uh, all that goes with sin, begin to speak and, and reveal itself to me, I recognize the fact that I'm slewed by it. And if I am slewed by sin, I do not have no part with Christ. So what I have to do here now is to find that peace that passes all understanding and acknowledge it can only help me if I would give myself unto the Lord. Wherefore, I'm saying to you, as Paul continued to speak, remember what he asked in the seventh verse. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Let hear what he is saying in the seventh, in the twelfth verse. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. And the reason why he can say that because Paul pointed out the same one you crucified, the same one you sell out in place of that thief and that robber, the same one that God raised from the dead. By him, by him today, this man is able to walk. By him today, this man is able to talk. By him today, this blind man is able to see. And what we have, you know, I'm seeing too many things happening today in the area of Christianity and professing to be all this and that. And I'm asking 
that we do not fall victim. Let us use the gifts as God bless us with. Even in the area of healing, there are those who are endowed with a deeper, deeper depth or, or a greater portion or a greater unction, if I use the correct word, a greater unction of the Spirit. Even in prophesying, and when we look at Moses, according to, number, I think it's Numbers 13, where he had to lay a portion, where God tell him, these are the words of God, Moses, a portion, hello, a portion of that which is upon thee. Now he would lay it upon these 70 elders. So he gave a little a unction of all that was upon him. He lay on 70 elders. So it's 70 portions upon these men. Now I want you to understand what is happening here. Moses was walking around in the wilderness for 40 years with all this power and authority. And he just put an unction on 70 elders and they prophesied all night that aroused the jealousy of Joshua. Say, so listen, what are they trying to do? They're trying to outdo you? And Moses had to let Joshua know, it's not about me, but it's about God. And what is it to be if they prophesy all night and they are speaking unto God? But I want you to see here, according to Numbers 13, where God said unto him, a portion of what is upon you. So you know, sometimes you come and you, everybody wants to do everything. We're not understanding what is happening. And our teachers are not teaching us the way they ought to. We have healers and we have healers. We have prophets and prophets. We have those who are walking under the anointing of apostleship. And we have those who are walking as teachers. And teachers can teach also prophets. So we have to know all of these areas here. And sometimes you would go to, to, a, to a healer and they will send you to somebody else if they are wise and the Holy Spirit says send him to Bishop Xavier. You wouldn't ask why or you wouldn't try to do something that is not for you to do. Because there is a certain anointing that you don't have. And there are times when someone comes to me that I may have to send them to you. What it shows here, I remember what Paul, when Paul asked, Peter was asked the question according to Acts 8. How come these didn't receive the Holy Spirit? Peter began to speak. He said, listen, he didn't baptize them over as I see some doing today, you baptize in the Baptist faith, well, we got to baptize you over. You baptize over there, we got to baptize you over. And yet still we come back and we say one faith, one Lord, one baptism. But observe the apostle, observe the man of God. He began to explain. He said they were baptized unto the baptism of repentance. And truly they could not receive the Holy Ghost until Christ sent the Holy Ghost. Are you thinking? Is this making sense to you? Well, it's written. The Holy Ghost did not come because Christ was not yet glorified. So at that point in time, they could not receive the Holy Ghost. But all that was John was preaching of is the baptism of repentance. Repent and believe. For what? The kingdom of God is at hand. Observe that. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's, it's not here yet, but it's at hand. So baptize, repent, believe, and get ready to receive. Get ready to receive. This is what Paul, I mean, John was doing. But when Peter recognized, he said, listen, they were baptized unto the baptism of repentance. And they could not, because Christ was not yet glorified. So what he did, and I want to say to some of you, this is how important the laying of hands are. 
And there are those of us who just reaching out there to lay hands. If you did not get the anointing to lay hands, please don't lay hands. Because what you would do, you now taking that which is on that person, you're taking it for yourself. When I say taking it, if it's a devil, you're taking that devil. Too. Be very careful. Be careful. You know, we love to do things. But what I'm showing you how important the laying on of hands are. So when Peter began to explain to them, all of these people here receiving the Holy Ghost, but they who baptized under John did not receive. Peter explained. Not that you need to. You know, we could make a big thing. Well, all right. How many are you here? All right. Well, we need to go. You need to be baptized again. No. But in the name of Jesus, he laid his hands on them. And immediately they received the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak in tongues. And this was to show that God is not a God who gave his word and take it back. Remember what John said. I baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Ghost. It couldn't be done before Christ was glorified. Remember what he said. He said, listen, it is expedient for me to go. He said, wait in the upper room. Wait. I was just, let me read that for you. The first, the first chapter of Acts, the eighth verse. The first chapter of Acts, the eighth verse. I'm going to read seven, verses seven and eight. And we are coming down fast. And he said unto them, let me read from 6. They ascend, this is when Christ was about to be ascended. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Even at this point, the disciples were asking these questions. So I would imagine those who were out of that paling of grace, what they expected of the Messiah. And this is why we have to search ourselves. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. But here what the eight verses say. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Wait. I just ran there to show you that when John baptized, they were, could not receive the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost was not yet sent. Only after Jesus' ascension was the Holy Ghost sent? He walked the earth for 40 days. And after 40 days he ascended. And on the 50th day, the Holy Spirit, he sent the Holy Ghost. And they were empowered. And they began to speak in other tongues. And I want to say to you, not everybody who was in the upper room were filled with the Holy Ghost. No. And this is why sometimes we have to be very careful. Because if everybody in the upper room filled with the Holy Ghost, there is nobody to rejoice and there is nobody to say, well, wow, this was something. This is a joy. And we have to know this. We have to be able to walk in that. So I'm saying to you here, the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and just and good. The only sad thing here is that we could not live according to them. So as we continue to struggle between the new two natures, which was then that which is good made debt unto me. Which was then that which is good made debt unto me. It sounds confusing, but it's, it's simple. The law is good, but it pointed out my sins 
And it caused me to fall, listen, to acknowledge, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, that by that which is good, the law, the commandments, pointing out my weaknesses, that sin by commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So when we begin to understand what we are doing here and where we are, it will bring us to the point for us to give thanks unto God. So we are going to continue in this lesson from the 13th verse in the almighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The law is the law sin? God forbid. So let us walk in the newness of life. So tonight to all saints, I give God the praise for you. I want to thank each and every one of you for being with me. And I know that in your wisdom and your spirituality, you will recognize the fact that it's not that I don't want to call out names, but in the midst of all of this, when the message is coming, I don't want to be taking time to say hello to this one. No, then I'm not really on the Father. I'm here on form and fashion, and I'm not here for that. I'm here to share the word of God with you. So I am saying tonight to every one of you, you would hear me say this from time to time, I truly appreciate your presence, and I will acknowledge you. You would know this, because on Facebook, so every time I acknowledge you, it will show up on your page, and I will always acknowledge you, giving God praise and giving him thanks for you. So may God bless us all, and may we have a watchful and pleasant night tonight. Again, I just want you to know, be careful with this monkeypox that is taking place in and among us. Avoid these areas because it's contagious. And there are other forces that is coming. Let us be ready. So stand firm in the liberty wherein you are called. So may God bless us all tonight and may God make his face to shine upon us and give us peace. And again, I say thank you all for the support and for the love that you share with me in these programs. Good night. May God bless you all. Amen.
Come on. Come Mm-hmm. <sighs> 